that brings us to our next topic about take this job and shove it, because that's what I did. I had a job working for a corporation uh, when I was younger, a printing plant. I got to thank that miserable boss I had because uh, he made me a wealthy man. He doesn't know it. Oh, yeah. I'll, I'll tell you. I'll tell the story. I'll share the story. I think most of the people who were involved are dead now, so I ain't killing their reputations. They're already on the other side making amends for what they did to a blind kid. Um, I worked in a uh, newspaper that had a sister company, a printing plant, and I worked hard. And I was one of those people that, they, after a while, they just put my name down no matter what, without even asking me for overtime and stuff. They didn't care. Uh, there were times when my log would show that between the two companies, they were sister companies of each other, except to, the time to walk from one building to the other, which was about a, oh, about a quarter mile apart. There were times that I worked 56 hours straight. And when the uh, printing presses went down, I threw a piece of cardboard down on a concrete floor or up on a steel bench and closed my eyes for 10 minutes while they repaired a paper rip. Slept on broken sleep and uh, had that job into my first couple of years of college, too, because I could work nights and, and go to college in the morning and uh, come out and do my homework in the evening and get some sleep and go back to work to print the morning paper. It was a, it was a great job. It was an interesting job. And one day they gave out raises and I got a nickel raise and everybody else got a 25 cent raise. So I went to the boss and said, how come I got a nickel? And they said, well, because you're blind. You're lucky you even have a job. Even though uh, I was the substitute for a number of guys, they said, well, you don't have a driver's license. And I said, but out of the 22 people in this department, there's only three people that drive and for a part of their job and when they go on vacation or get sick there's plenty of other people who can drive and there's plenty of people who don't go out and drive and they said no well it is what it is because you don't have a driver's license okay and then about oh two weeks after that one day i found myself training four young teenagers still in high school and they were all starting at more money per hour than i was making after six seven years and that didn't sit well with me because I could tell they weren't going to last. Their heart wasn't in it. They weren't interested in working. They probably were told uh, by their parents, uh, you know, get a job or we're going to throw you out or something. It was in the late 60s, well, an era of long hair. And as long as you're under my roof, you do it my way. Those, For some of those, you remember those lectures or speeches that you heard. And then about a couple weeks after that came my take this job and shove it moment. I was dating a gal who uh, was going to go to France for two years and study. And I had it all set up that I was going to have a uh, cook dinner and have a nice time and uh, spend some time with her before she left because I wasn't going to see her for two years. And they asked me to come into work at one o'clock in the morning on my day off. This would have been my 14th day in a row working straight. And I said, sure, I will come in to help out. So I went in at one o'clock in the morning. And at 4.30, we finished the morning paper. And they said, look, we got something special. Can you stay another hour and a half for two hours? We're sure to man. I said, sure. No, And, of course, I didn't plan to be there very long. I was just going in to help out. And then that was over. And at 7 in the morning, they said, uh, can you hang around just a minute until we start the next job here we got to do, which was getting ready for the Sunday paper and running a giant collator machine. And uh, had it needed 13 people on that machine to run it. And they were short couple, and they knew that I could hold down two or three stations on the machine and keep up with the work, even though I didn't have a driver's license. And they knew that I could uh, work at either end of that machine and outwork any two people they were going to put on that machine. They knew that. And then it was, well, you know, we'll get someone here by 10 in the morning. Now, I've been there since 1 o'clock in the morning. It's now 10 o'clock. I said, look, I got to go. And they said, look, can you just stay till noon? There'll be people coming in here, and we'll be able to, some people will be able to come down here and whatever. So I stayed till noon, and they said, can you stay till the afternoon paper runs? And so at one thirty, two o'clock, nobody was there to relieve me. Now, I'm going on 12 and a half hours, 13 hours, no lunch, no nothing. I didn't plan to be there that long, and it's my day off, and by state law, you weren't allowed to work 14 days straight without a day off. And uh, about 4.30 in the afternoon, with knowing that I had a ride arranged to get me groceries and everything, because I don't drive, and so that I could cook a dinner for this girl that I had been dating that I wasn't going to see for two years. 
I just uh, went to the boss and said, look, I've just got to go. Now, at this point, I had been there 15 hours, 15, uh, yeah, 15 and a half hours working with no lunch break, no nothing. And he turns to me and says to me, well, let me put it this way. If you go now, don't, don't bother coming back. Hmm. And I said to him, well, I've got my jacket on, so goodbye. And I walked out the door. And I got about, oh, 150 feet up the hill. And I turned around and shook my fist at that building with tears in my eyes. I said, this is what it comes to after busting my heart out. I mean, I didn't even go to my senior prom because they needed someone to work that night. I was a dedicated company man. The other folks my age used to laugh at me because I worked so hard. I'll tell you how many hours I worked some months. I was hungry. I was raised poor and I was hungry. At $2.35 an hour in July of 1968, I worked so many hours that I put $1,400 in the bank so that I could go back to school in August so I could pay my tuition and uh, save money to do that and go back to college. And I made two promises to myself. Number one, that I could starve on my own without their help. <laughs> okay. And I was right. That's when I started my first construction and home improvement company. And the second, it was tough for the first few years, but I managed. I, you know, managed to actually gain a few pounds. And uh, the second thing I made myself a promise that as long as I lived, I would never let another man tell me what I was worth per hour. And I've never, ever, ever broken that promise to myself. Your only decision when you hire me is, do you want to pay what I'm asking? If not, you don't get to hire me. It's just that simple. And that comes from take this job and shove it. That's why I had uh, Dave play that song for me here tonight. Because a lot of people in the trades have a day of reckoning where they realize that they want to be the captain of their own ship. And in fact, the people in the trades who go on their own and actually end up doing the same exact work that they were doing before for someone else, typically earn twice as much annually as they did working for someone else. If you're willing to shoulder the responsibility of the bookkeeping and the money and the management and all those other things that you have to do, you will make more money because you get paid for all those things. And the estimating, and the bookkeeping, and the banking, and the taxes, and and the material acquisition, and, and getting the word out so that you've got a steady flow of jobs and work to go look at. You begin to hold down two or three, four other jobs that any one of which unto itself is a full-time career for most people, and you just squeeze them in somehow, and uh, all of a sudden you start doing really well. And it's 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 amazing. It's amazing. Like Mike Rowe said, of all those people he interviewed and America's dirtiest jobs, all but two of them were multimillionaires. You got your ear to the ground. You hear things. Uh, in my particular case, uh, I started uh, doing some uh, work for uh, just boarding up buildings for a bank that when they foreclosed them, they were in the roughest part of town and all. And, uh, and one day the banker said, you know, you've been keeping these buildings going for us on, on basically guts and spit. And uh, why don't you buy some of these buildings? We'll give you a mortgage. And I said, I don't have any money. I don't know about all this stuff. Well, you're doing all the work. You're doing the property management and everything else. You got the hard part of the job. You might as well own the buildings. And that led me to some other opportunities to uh, plug into the wonderful world of uh, rehab and sweat equity and all that. And didn't take long to uh, put together a multi-million dollar portfolio of properties. Why? Because I was in the trades. I could do anything. I could do the plumbing, I could do the electrical, I could do the, uh, you know, the roofing, the siding, replace the windows, whatever was needed, we could do it. And because the company grew and I had some help, you know, on rainy days, that's where my help went. They were on payroll anyway, might as well have them doing something. So it leads to other things and it leads to great opportunities. I, I won't even quote some of the annual incomes that I earned in those days because you wouldn't believe them anyway, because even by today's standards, they were like just warped. And you know what I'm going to do, though, because part of all of that, when you're that successful, you got to be real righteous. And uh, Dave, why don't we cue up that next song there about people who didn't play it straight when they were blessed with a lot of money and they didn't treat folks right. 
And we'll play that song, and then I'll tell you a few other things when we come back. You are listening to I Love My Tools, the radio show, with your host, Mike DiZino, America's Blind Tradesman. And now, back to the show. All right. Here in the South, we do see chain gangs. So still, anyway, uh, the reason I played that song right now is because as you are blessed and as it grows, and we'll be talking about this in our in our mentorship program about self-employment in the trades that we'll be doing later on this year here for uh, for members of the I Love My Tools crew, what you will find is don't screw up especially when you're taking deposits on jobs, because I know guys that live from deposit to deposit, and they're paying last month's bills with next month's money, and you can't do that very successfully because you can't grow that way. And they and their philosophy is, well, if each year I make 10% more than the previous year, I can cover the losses or the mismanaged money from the previous year. Well, that works until you have a 2008 financial collapse and then all of a sudden you get caught in all the lies and all the fraud and all the double dealing and all the other nonsense you did. Creditors, they can prosecute, especially if there's fraud involved. So you've got to play it righteous, especially if you're blessed that way. You've got to be a good steward. Uh, there's, um, for those of you who are people of faith in the Bible, there's a lot of references to stewardship. And in fact, stewardship is one of the highest callings because... When you are blessed, you are charged then with the uh, the proper management of that. You have people to take care of, and you have employees, and you have customers. you got to give to Caesar that which is Caesar's. I, can't, I cannot believe how many people who go self-employed take all the money in, and they don't know the difference between cash flow and profit. But for the ones that manage it well and do well, they do very well. As a matter of fact, Dave... If you'd share just for a minute, you know a guy who uh, started out as a truck driver and ended up owning his own fleet of trucks, retiring in just a few years as a multimillionaire. You want to share some of that story and how he did that? Uh, Yeah, again, the trucking is something that you either love it or you hate it, and he happened to love it. Uh, Early on, he knew that that's exactly what he wanted to do after being introduced to it. So instead of waiting, uh, he didn't wait around. His company offered him an opportunity to lease his first truck and to become an owner-operator. And that's exactly what he did. Well, instead of going out like most of us do, uh, he didn't have any other responsibilities at the time. And ultimately, on the road, he actually did end up meeting his girlfriend, and she traveled with him everywhere. They, The two of them lived on the road. Because you have expense accounts with certain uh, uh certain trucking industries, depending on where you're going, what you're doing, other than going to the, the big truck cities, these truck uh, stops where you can wash your clothes, uh, you know, do some shopping, uh, you know, get your meal, uh, take in a movie. It, it's all there for you. It, it's a city within itself, and it's really fun and exciting. And he didn't splurge on oddball stuff. He didn't worry about going out, and he didn't have to worry about having a home or uh, a car because he had his truck. Uh, And, of course, it takes about two, three years, and that first truck was paid for in full. Keep up on the maintenance, and now all that truck payments that was going out was more profit coming back into his pocket. Well, they continued, him and his uh, uh, wife, uh, they they got married. Uh, They continued, and and about eight, nine years out there from the time he started, and I think it was about he was into his third or fourth year, about halfway through, uh, when he met up with uh, his wife. Uh, they decided, okay, well, uh, let's have a baby. They were still living on the road. Uh, he says, well, no problem. Uh, she got pregnant. So they said, okay, time to settle down. Instead of wasting all that money, he was investing it and putting it all in the bank. And uh, they decided, okay, they've traveled the whole United States multiple times. Uh, he had already bought um, uh, a second truck at that time. He did hire have a second truck. Uh, after he bought the one, it was paid off. He kept a, stayed that for a year. Then he leased another one and put a relative of his actually in a second rig. So that's how he started with having two, you know, having two trucks. And a long story short, by the time it was all done in less than a 10-year time period, he uh, retired a multimillionaire, went out and bought a 1,500-acre farm up in the mountains there. That's where him and his wife decided they wanted to settle down at and spend the rest of their life for cash money. Uh, bought that uh, property, that big farm, 
And within a matter of a uh, very short time, he was up to either eight or nine trucks and never worked again a day in his life. He retired a multimillionaire and never once put a single thing on debt. Never once had a credit card. Everything was always cash money. And that's the other beauty about the trucking industry. If you take your money that you make, you don't need it. You're living in your truck. They're providing the truck. You don't need a home. You don't need a car. You have your vehicle. Your truck is your vehicle. Uh, other than needing to keep a, you know, a clean pair of, uh, you know, a couple of pairs of jeans and uh, some shirts, what do you really need? You know, and if you're not out there eating uh, steak every night and uh, and lobster, uh, you you can uh, live quite modestly, uh, you know, on a very minimal budget. Budget, and all the rest is pure profit that you can sink back into your business, back into your, you know, truck if you want to buy that truck and get ready to buy the next truck and so on and so forth. Uh, and it's uh, very easily to do. The bottom line is, this comes down any trade you go into. You must be self-motivated and self-reliable, responsible. If you're not a responsible individual, you're going to fail. Just like Mike was saying earlier. You know, you play the games, you don't understand the ins and outs of the uh, bookkeeping side of things. You get in a lot of trouble. Uh, you know, you're going you're gonna to lose your shirt. You're not going to you know, have that probability. But uh, if you get with the right mentoring, you get with the right program, you get with something like we had brought up earlier, the apprenticeships, you know, they do still exist out there. And a lot of your trades require you to apprentice under someone before you can get your state license, you know, whether you're doing uh, plumbing, electrical, air conditioning, refrigeration, all those things require X amount of years of apprenticeships before you can even uh, begin that. We don't hear too much about that. Our kids don't hear about this stuff in school. Uh, that's one thing that Europe has had over us for a long time. They understand their uh, apprenticeships and they begin their apprenticeships at 14 years old. Uh, it, it's uh, pretty amazing the education system, the way it's set up over there. And I've always admired that. And uh, it's something that I wish we would lean uh, a little bit more towards because uh, we're only hurting ourselves and our children uh, by not having that type of a program in place. And luckily today, a lot of the states are bringing back uh, a lot of those vocational and botech type of uh, directed training instead of just general education. It's a directed form of education. But uh, trucking is, is a lot of fun. You know, it's a lot of excitement. Uh, I also one time even had my own roofing and siding business, a little sideline I was doing. I was working for somebody else uh, for a while, and I still actually worked with that team at the same time. Uh, but we were doing different aspects of the job. And the boss actually came to me one day. He says, oh, you know, you've been doing roofing and siding all your life. And he says, well, I got a couple of roofing jobs coming up. Do you want to subcontract them? I'm like, well, I never did that before. And he actually showed me. He said, well, this is how you would go about doing it. You know, how much, uh, you know, did you make up there? Blah, blah, blah. And he, and he actually taught me how to become a subcontractor for him, how to price out the materials, how to measure out the jobs and uh, and whatnot. And that was really neat. You know, a lot of guys in the trade, uh, they will do that. You know, of course, it, he could have just kept me on by the hour. He didn't have to teach me how to be a subcontractor. But hey, if you're good to them, they're going to be good to you. And they're going to they all they enjoy it. It gives them pleasure to share that and pass that on to someone else. And there's lots of guys out there that will help you. Let me just give some of the resources. One of the resources that you can count on is an organization called SCORE. And it stands for the Senior Corps of Retired Executives. And these are guys who worked in corporate America and have skills in accounting and how to do a business plan and how to structure a company and how to do payroll and all that other stuff. And it's free. And they're part of the uh, Small Business Administration. And you can just sit down with them and talk to them all day long, bring them your questions, and they're there to help you. Also, there are people, and I, I got to tell you something, there was a wonderful gentleman uh, who was a Texan, and I was in my late 20s, and I got to meet this man, and I went to work for him because I just had to be around him. Everybody is saying he was worth $80 million. Now, at that point in my life, I had been trying to make my first million, and I wasn't very successful at it. I probably had 100 bucks in the bank at that point, and uh, been a lot of places, done a lot of things, bought a lot of equipment and tools because I was still in that investing stage where I was building my businesses and getting my vehicles and everything else. Plus, at the time, I also had a band and stuff, so we had all that equipment and stuff we had to buy and stuff. But this gentleman, I just call him Mr. B. 
okay, because that was his last name. I'm not going to share it. I don't have his permission to share his name, but I, I just went to him one day, and I said, Mr. B, they, they say you're worth $80 million, and he laughed, and he said, yeah, they say a lot of things, and I said, um, I was wondering, how, how, how does somebody make $80 million? And he laughed, and he was a big old Texan, and he said to me, do you really want to know how to make $80 million? And I said, yes, sir, Mr. B, I'd really like to know. No, 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 do you really, really want to know? And I said, yes, sir. He put his arm around me and pulled me to him nose to nose. And he said, I'm going to tell you the secret. I'm going to tell you the secret right now, how you make $80 million. He said, you earn your living from nine to five, and you make your fortune from five to midnight. <laughs> In play words, stop looking at the clock. When there's work, go work it. And just because you're making more, like Dave said, start putting some of that money away because opportunities will come up. And that's what happened with me. I didn't have all that much money when the bank convinced me to buy two inner city sweat equity buildings. In fact, I had that bartered to the point where there was a first, second, third, and fourth mortgage on them. And I even worked for a uh, restaurant owner who had a, an attorney who had a large bar bill and I told the restaurant owner that I would do work around his restaurant and pay off the attorney's bar bill. And the owner said to me, well, at least you show up. And he said, so good. And I said, can I have a paid receipt on that bar bill? And that attorney wasn't too far from the restaurant. And I actually went up to the attorney, walked in, and the, and the secretary said to me, and you are who? And I told her who I was. And I said, may I see Mr. So-and-so? And she said, well, why? And I said, because uh, he's my attorney. I'm his client. And she said to me, you are? And so she went in and told him. And he came out of the office and said, she says, you're my client, and I handed him the paid receipt for the bar bill, and I said, I need a closing handled. And he looked at that paid receipt and said, come on in, client. <laughs> so I bartered his bar bill so, so that I could pay for a closing on those two buildings, and I actually bought those buildings uh, for absolutely zero money, which is good. Everything was paper because I didn't have any money. And then I got the restaurant owner to cater the closing. So the bank was there and the second mortgage person was there and the, and the third mortgage people were there and everybody else was all happy to be rid of these buildings and, and they were all there. And then I had the restaurant owner cater it. I mean, we had, we had some great food. There were seafood restaurants and we had shrimp and sushi and all kinds of stuff at the closing. It was a catered closing in the attorney's office and it was kind of cool. And as I was leaving the attorney's office, the attorney tapped me on the shoulder and said, there's a filing fee with the town clerk to put the buildings in your name, and that was $29, and that I can't barter. He said I had to pay that. So I wrote him a check for the $29, and you know what, Dave? That check was no good. <laughs> I didn't have $29 <laughs> to my name. But it was the 28th of February, and I knew the next day on March 1st I could go collect rents because that's what I'd been doing for the bank. That's right. And that's, what I, and that's how I covered that check. And uh, someday I'll tell that whole story because that's an interesting story about the first door I knocked on. But that's another story. And 37 months later, with those two buildings, with the equity in those two buildings and trading and buying property and flipping this and flipping that, I was closing on a million-dollar piece of land on my signature alone. And that was really something. My real estate portfolio was worth $4.3 million in 37 months. This is America, guys, gals. It's a great country. There is so much possibility. Stop letting people tell you that there's no hope. Stop letting people tell you there is no future. Nothing could be further from the truth that is a lie from the pits of hell. Anybody who would tell you there is no hope, there is nobody more evil than a person who will try to take hope away from another person. This is America. The American dream is alive and well. Tonight, while we're sitting here, do you know an actual statistic, Dave? And I get so excited when I quote this. See, I was raised poor. And when I was 14 years old, I started studying wealth. I wanted to know how come the guy who was the local radio DJ could pull up with a brand new Corvette a $20,000 car back in the day or whatever it was, $8,000, whatever it was. It was an expensive car back in those days in the 50s and 60s. I want to know how people did that. I want to know how people lived in those big houses because when my dad had the TV business, the only people who were affording color TV, a color television set, 
was was like an expensive item. It was like twenty two hundred dollars for a color TV back in nineteen fifty four. That was a down payment on a house back then. You could buy a house for eight or ten thousand dollars back then. And and who had them? The factory owners, the attorneys, the uh, doctors, the undertakers, the politicians. You know, I went all these houses, and man, the stuff they had in their house. How do people get this kind of money? So I began to study wealth, and here's what I discovered. Every year in the United States, there are more new millionaires than there were the year before. In the 1890s, it was something like only one person out of a thousand in the United States was a millionaire. By the 1950s, it was one out of 300. Today, it's one person out of nine that has a million dollars worth. One out of nine. Your odds are getting better. Get in the game. You know, on my business card for the website, um, ilovemytools.com, the back of my business card, you know what it says? It says, life is like sports. The win is credited to the players, not the spectators. Stop being a spectator of your own life. Stop sitting there watching your life go by. There's no instant replay for your life. I, I, you know, I know they do it in football games, and I knew they did baseball games. They show the highlights over and over again. Life isn't that way. You don't get an instant replay on this. This is your one shot at it. Stop being a spectator to your own life. Get into the game. I'm telling you, we are so blessed in this country. And the trades for the average person who just wants to work hard, is willing to learn, willing to play it straight, can be a millionaire, and you could do it through the trades as a vehicle. And it's just so easy to do. And that's why I'm telling you, and when I say the trades, there's lots of trades. People think trades, well, you know, auto mechanic, carpenter, plumber, iron worker. Yeah, there's lots of trades that you could dedicate yourself to. There's law enforcement, there's nursing. Some of the trades have limited opportunity, and because you can only work for limited institutions like teaching now teaching to me is a calling it, it, it goes beyond a trade unfortunately when you teach you can't one day say take this job and shove it and go out and start your own school that's a little hard to do so you're stuck because if you're in a county school system and you don't like the way they're teaching and you don't approve of their methods it's really hard for you to just quit and go down the street to their competition and and get a job or compete against them but uh that's something that I did, though. Uh, this is what I'll share uh, when we do the mentoring program uh, coming up here in a few months. We're going to be starting that. Uh, but it's really funny because the companies that wouldn't hire me because I was blind, I ended up starting a company just like theirs. And it was so funny because a couple of the companies, and I'll share the stories of how I did this, I grew one company in 18 months so big that it was bigger than the companies in the area that were 25 years in business. I was hiring them, Dave, as my subcontractor to handle the work I couldn't handle. I was earning a profit on my competition. <laughs> There's a great concept, making a profit on your competition. Don't let folks tell you that the American dream is dead because it is not dead. It is alive and well, but it's for the person who has passion and creative thought. This is why. Go out there and sample the trades. Go out there and sample different jobs. Go out there and do a few different things till you find the one that just makes your socks go up and down, the one that excites you, the one where you go to bed exhausted at night, but you can't wake up to get in the morning and get back out there again doing it. And that it will become your life's calling. And if you can find to work and get someone to pay you while you do your passion, what's fun to do, I'm telling you, you will never work another day in your life. Every day will be play. Every day will be vacation. You'll work 60, 70, 80 hours a week and have a life that most people would envy because you'll be happy. You won't be stressed out. You won't be dying of a heart attack at 45 years old. The trades are a good life, a good lifestyle if you're cut out for it, and you'll never know if you don't try. Next time your birthday comes and they ask you or Christmas comes, ask Santa Claus for one of those 200-piece toolboxes and, and start messing around the house. You fix that drawer that won't work. Fix that door that's stuck. Hang those tall bars your mom or your 
wife has been after you to take care of, fix those doorknobs, whatever. Just do little things around the house and stuff and around your own uh, place of work and stuff. It's, it's just amazing. The victories compound upon themselves. They really do. We have another song, don't we? This song is appropriate for this topic about hard work and passion. And you got to hear this song coming up with Mr. Tennessee Ernie Ford. Hey, you are listening to an episode of I Love My Tools, the radio show, with your host, Mike DiZino, America's Blind Tradesman. And now, let's get right back to the show. All right. Thank you, Tennessee Ernie Ford. The reason I played that song, there's a method to my madness for these songs, you know. Miners are not afraid of hard work. God bless those coal miners. I mean, that is a hard, hard trade career Unfortunately, as hard as they work in those god-awful conditions they work in, even with all the mining laws and regulations and everything, it's a special breed of men and women that go down into those mines. The unfair part is they're stuck to that geographic area because there aren't mines in every town in the United States where you could just pick up and move. And when the mine closes, the mine is the big industry of that town, and the town fails. The town dies. So my hat's off to the coal miners. And uh, right now, uh, for those of you of people of faith, you might want to just say a prayer tonight uh, for your blessings, of course. But uh, for all those people there in eastern Ohio and up there in West Virginia and stuff, this um, the coal industry has been decimated over the last couple of years. And uh, there's a lot of good folks, hardworking folks that want a job and they don't have it because the mines are closed or there's no market for the coal as we transition into other energy sources or political sources or whatever, it's really sad. Uh, You know, there's all these policies that come out of Washington, D.C., and those policies don't necessarily take into account the full human factor of what they're, you know, they can sign all the pens they want and pass them out, all those ceremonial pens on legislation, but the impact is people, not policy. So um, hopefully um, the American public is awakened and maybe there'll be some changes in this new election coming up here and whoever the new president is, hopefully they will address jobs and they'll address the infrastructure in this country because start repairing the bridges and the roads and all that and uh, the pipelines and everything else that need to be addressed and get this country humming again and get energy down in prices and start bringing back companies to our shores and stuff. And let's just get everybody working again. Because you know what? It doesn't matter whether you're on the left or the right politically. It doesn't matter whether you believe in uh, a government that helps out a lot of people or a government that helps a fewer number of people because they don't need your help because they're doing fine on their own. The bottom line is the real answer to anything wrong right now in our country is jobs. And the trades are where they've got to be because those are the high-paying jobs typically. And in those trades, those people pay taxes. And when they pay taxes, another 10 or 15 or 20 million people go back to work. That extra money goes to our government. You know what happens? The government then has the money for all the programs. So it doesn't matter whether you're on the left, on the right, if which party, you know, a D or an R or an I, whatever. The bottom line is the more of us that go back to work, the better the country becomes because the money's there to do a social program, a, a military program, build a wall, don't build a wall, do this, do that. The money's there. So let's get America working again here. Let's get the trades out there. Start telling your kids, hey, 26 years old living in your basement. That's enough. You know, it's time to get a job, and whatever it is, where they got 10 more years to go to college because they have no motivation. It's time to take action. It's time to plug into the American dream and get it going again. But self-employment in the trades, yes, it's hard work. And you'll find yourself learning skills and doing things you never thought you were capable of doing. It's a tremendous growth. But it pays off. It pays off. And there's more people that are successful. Like I say, the majority of the people who work in the trades in their lifetime, their working career, will out-earn most of the people who go to college. Now, I'm not against college. Went there myself. But when you go there, if you really want to be successful going to college today, you really need to be involved in the STEM program. And that's S-T-E-M. And that stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics. Those are the kinds of things you should be majoring in. 
you need to push your guidance counselors in college. If they're saying you should be taking 15th century French female poetry, uh, why? Who's going to hire you? Show me the jobs. That's what you should be saying, young folks. But you know what's happened in recent years? Guidance counselors in colleges have become nothing more than shills for the financial loan office. Their job is to bring in the money so that they can continue to get paid and by putting you into debt. And I can't tell you how many of them are playing a bait-and-switch game. And I'm surprised there isn't some federal legislation against it where they get you in the first two years and they tell you, oh, yeah, sure, yeah, basket weaving, oh, yeah, that's great. Oh, we've got courses in that. We've got courses in kabuki art and all that or, and everything else. And then at the end of it, you find out there's no jobs to be had. So in your last two years, they switch you over to something else. And meanwhile, you wasted all that money up front. And they do other things, too, and it's wrong what they do. Everybody gets a scholarship the first two years, and then all of a sudden you were told, well, those programs went away, and in your junior and senior year, you got to fork over the cash, and now you're in debt. So there's no free lunch out there. And you know what? When you're going to college, you are a consumer of a product. You are purchasing a product. You would not accept a car that performed as badly as your college education for most people. You would not. Uh, you would not buy a car where every year they told you, oh, by the way, you owe more for that car. If you want to continue to drive that car, it's going to cost you more this year. So you've got to pay more. You've got to go with the debt again. We've got to rewrite your car loan. This is the scam of what they do to our youth in this country. It's, it's a sin. It really is. Stay out of it. Find out if you're cut out for the trades. Get into the trades. Find something else you could do. Besides, in the trades, we have privileges that the rest of the society doesn't have. Did you know that? Hey, we have privileges. You see all this turmoil right now on college campuses? Somebody is writing political messages with chalk, and our youth see that as violence. They see that as hate speech. Chalk. Chalk. But you know, in the trade, we get paid to write with chalk. Yeah, we put chalk marks on all kinds of things. We do calculations with it. I one time did a chalk line that was 100 feet long, and you know when I did that? They didn't yell at me. They paid me for it and told me I did a good job. So, if you like to play with chalk and you don't see chalk as an enemy, <laughs> like what's going on in the news these days, then you get to play with chalk. It's allowed in the trades to play with chalk. And colors, too. You can get red chalk, blue chalk, green chalk, yellow chalk, white chalk. I mean, it's just absolutely amazing. Orange chalk. So it's, it's awesome that you can play with all that chalk. So, again, another reason why you should be in the trade. Speaking of in the trade, go to ilovemytools.com and why don't you uh, join the crew. Register and uh, join the crew and get yourself in the loop to uh, participate in some of the drawings and things we're going to be doing here shortly and plug into some of the videos that are up there, the how-to sections and stuff, uh, where I can speak to you personally and share with you some of the eye tricks that I've learned that empowered a blind guy to become a skilled tradesman. You might find some of these tools useful, but guys used to work for me in my companies and stuff. We used to call it doing it the blind way, and a lot of them adopted it because it was easier than doing it the same way. So you might find a few things that could help you out with some of the problems you're wrestling with over at ilovemytools.com. If you have questions or something you'd like to see us address here on the show, I love my tools, the radio show. You could just simply send over to comments at I love my tools.com or questions at I love my tools.com. And if you'd like to play the quiz, uh, are you smarter than a blind tradesman? So politically incorrect. That's the thing I love about the trades. We're not politically correct in the trades. I'm sorry. We are who we are in the trades, and uh, we're happier for it. You can go to ilovemytools.com forward slash apps, and you could take one of the quizzes. They don't cost anything except maybe a little bit of pride, a little loss of dignity. And so if you score worse than a blind guy, come on, what's the game here? What gives? But enjoy the quizzes because you might find you have some knowledge right now that you could turn into an income. You might already know what your calling is. Take those quizzes and see what your general knowledge is in plumbing, electrical, carpentry, general handyman, automotive, uh, some of the different trades. Uh, there's questions there on everything from welding to motor rebuilding to just all kinds of stuff it was fun it was fun doing a matter of fact uh, 
Uh, we're planning uh, a couple more quizzes right now. And if you like what you see there on those apps and stuff, uh, give a shout out on the comments or what, let them know that you liked what they did. Tonight, midnight, right here on AmericanPatriotRadio.com, Reverend Foster Clark, Friday Night Gospel, The Sounds of Romance. Reverend Clark does an awesome show for the married couples and uh, couples who are committed and couples who should be committed, maybe. If you've got somebody significant uh, in your life and, you know, you worked hard to find that person, maybe uh, you needed to give a good reverend a listen to and maybe learn a few skills on how to hold on to that person now that they're part of your life. And that's coming up at midnight here tonight, right here on American Patriot Radio. And we do want to thank the folks at American Patriot Radio for the airtime, for the I Love My Tools, the radio show. Uh, We do appreciate that, and we do appreciate all of you who joined us here tonight for our first broadcast, our premier broadcast. We do have a chat line. We have a chat room open over at American Patriot Radio when we're live and on the air. You can participate there and make comments. We do have a call-in number. Don't be shy. We would love to hear from me on the air. And if you have a topic or a trade or a skill, and you'd like to be interviewed on the show and discuss that trade or skill, we would love to hear about it. Male, female, whatever. If you've got the skill, gender is irrelevant. Over the years, I've worked with plumbers and electricians and painters and carpenters and roofers of both genders. It was great times we had. We had great crews, and we had a lot of fun, and the day flew by. We worked hard, got a lot done, but boy, it flew by because we had so much fun on the job. And, And there's that camaraderie and team spirit. There's nothing like being on a job site with a crew that's clicking and you just step back at the end of the day and you look at it and you say, I was part of the team that built that. And you step back to admire your work. In most of the trades, you can do that. If you're a roofer, I would not recommend you step back to admire your work. That could be dangerous. Right, Dave? Been there, done that. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I've had a few guys who've done that too. Take the power broom and run right off a building and it's like, where did Herman go? He went over the edge with the power broom. And that's another story. We'll be sharing some of those funny stories that we have in the trade so that you can learn from other people's mistakes and other people's uh, lack of good judgment. Uh, So we'll keep you out of the bar pit, as they say, on those things. I think what we're going to do is, Dave, when we close, I want to play that uh, I'm a Truck Driving Man song. I love that song. And and that'll be an honor of you sharing tonight about the trucking industry. Folks, join us again here next week. Bring your questions again, questions at ilovemytools.com. Make your comments at comments at ilovemytools.com. And for those of you that would love to take the quizzes, you can do those at ilovemytools.com forward slash apps and just go there and take the quizzes and see if you're smarter than a blind tradesman. Having said all that, folks, take care of yourselves. God bless you all. Have a great week. And remember, There's no feeling in the world like the feeling of accomplishment when you've done something with your own two hands. Love the trades. Good way to go. Great way to live, even if you're just doing it part-time. Take care of yourselves, folks. And remember, America is the greatest country in the world because we still have the American dream. And any part of it that you want is yours for the taking. God bless you all. Have a great night.